Um, that's why certain people appear bright until you hear them speak. Hopefully that won't be the case for me, but if it is, I apologize. Uh, I wanted to introduce you. This is Brigham Young University, where I am a faculty member at. We're kind of nestled right at the base of the mountain, and it's a beautiful spot, and I'm anxious to go home. It's been a couple of months here in China, which I've loved, but uh, it's, there's no place like home. Uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, Brigham Young University is a, a great place to be. We've got some great students there. It's about uh, similar size to Hong Kong University, it sounds like, when I uh, looked at Hong Kong University online. One of the unique pieces is that uh, there's a lot of uh, foreign language speaking folks at uh, BYU. 70% of campus speaks a second language, and at any given time, about a third of the, po the campus population is enrolled in a foreign language class. Uh, and there's older, over 85 languages taught on campus. And 133 study abroad programs, of which one of them was the one that uh, Dino referenced. This is my lab, uh, established in 2007. Uh, we've had 10 PhD students, seven of them current there, 14 MS students, two current, and uh, over 70 undergraduate in, uh, students in our lab. And uh, our areas of focus, mechanical factors for low back pain, characterization of spinal ligaments and their contributions to spinal stability, a novel alpaca preclinical animal model, which is really fun and recent work for us, and I won't be talking about it today, but if you have questions about alpacas, I'm a newly formed expert on some aspects of them. Medical device innovation and then engineering education. Uh, so where does the Tau come into this? Um, uh, and essentially, this has to do with the fact that uh, we have had quite a few successes in terms of uh, bringing uh, technologies, inventing new technologies, and having them kind of transition out of our lab. And as I've reflected back over the past decade as to how and why that works, it seems like there's some common themes. One of them is uh, understanding things first, and that probably resonates with you a lot, is that the first step to any innovation is really understanding. And then uh, seeing into what it is, what things should be left alone and work just the same way they used to work, and distinguishing that from the things that should be fixed because they're broken. And then uh, the other piece of that is utilizing uh, your own strengths, and in this case, my own strengths, combining them with the strengths of others, because rare is it that anything we would accomplish now would happen in isolation. We live in a time when all the great things, uh, I, I think, uh, mostly happen through collaboration and then uh, approaching the problem from a fresh perspective. Well, I got into spine through a circuitous route. I didn't start out studying spine. In fact, my PhD was looking at uh, medical device imaging and combining it with finite element analysis. I very much stayed away from uh, you know, soft tissue, hard tissue, and, and basically anything that would get my hands dirty. I was forced into looking into things that were a little more practical uh, after I came back to academia, but I stayed very much in the computational realm up until the point at which I became a consultant. And at that point, I started doing consulting, uh, and I was back in Philadelphia working for a company called Exponent. And I started doing consulting for a lot of the major orthopedic manufacturing companies. And one of the things that I noticed is how dysfunctional a lot of the design work was that uh, although there's great minds there, that sometimes some of the innovation that was happening wasn't based on a fundamental understanding, a fundamental understanding of the, the really the nature of the body part that they were looking at. And I was looking mainly at spine, and there was a lot of misunderstanding as to how the spine works, especially mechanically, and I thought, of all the places, maybe there's a place I could make a difference. And so I came at the spine maybe a little bit different. I, I asked the question, is the spine really just dysfunctional and that's why so many people have problems with it? Or maybe it's really an elegant piece of engineering. And if it's an elegant piece of engineering, maybe I can understand how it works well and then use that to decide what's going wrong with it and, and approach it that. And, and this is just some of the thoughts I had as I was going this direction saying, man, who designs this thing as a stacked thin structure intended to support large compressive loads? That's like the number one rule of engineering is you don't make something that's going to buckle, and this comes almost set up to pre-buckle. Um, but it turns out that that was actually a misnomer. The spine is actually very well designed. I, in fact, these little tethers here, the spinal ligaments, which are often overlooked, 
tend to be one of the most beautiful pieces of engineering that I've seen. And so this is where I spent my early career is looking at how these uh, spinal ligaments work because they tie the whole system together in, in a way it's, uh, I often put it as an analogy to a cable suspension bridge. It just, it makes the whole thing work even though it has a tremendous amount of flexibility and motion. This is one of the devices we came up with in our lab. It's, we call it the anisotropic small punch test. And uh, basically it's a way of looking at very, very small pieces of tissue. It's got a couple of different uh, high resolution cameras. It's got a very tiny uh, indenter here that sits in the center and the small piece of tissue sits here. And so we're able to measure pieces of ligament tissue that are about four to six millimeters in diameter and about a half millimeter in thickness which allowed us to do something that no one has ever done before, which was to look at the material properties of those. And I know you're not all engineers, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'll show you the kind of the basic principle is that when you push up on this and you look at it from two different angles, one angle looks very taut like this, like the edges of the lines of a tent. And when you look at it at the orthogonal direction, you actually see this bending in. This is exactly the same piece of ligament tissue but the change in, uh, in profile here is actually due to the anisotropy of the tissue. So from one very small sample, using camera data and collecting the force displacement tissue, we're actually able to match that in the computer using a finite element software, and then predict the anisotropic constitutive properties. So all of the ways this works in different directions from a very small sample. And so we can take multiple samples from a single, a single donor source uh, we started looking at pre-strain in the spinal ligaments, which is something that, again, has been largely ignored, but plays a large role. And we've seen a lot of this in the, in the knee. Um, the, the technique we used for this was pretty straightforward. We used tattoo ink. We put a bunch of dots on to track position. We took images. We resected then the pieces of uh, ligament out and saw how the relationship of the dots changed and we're able to come up with the properties of those spinal ligaments. We found some interesting things that uh, are maybe relevant to you as you look at uh, the spine. One of them was the supraspinous ligament, which we always look at and think is just a, a great mechanical structure, and it has um, uh, maybe some strong mechanical properties, but its pre-strain is actually negative. Uh, which is unique among biological tissues, meaning that it starts out in your normal erect posture, actually buckled, and meaning that as you move forward into flexion, then it actually gets pulled. So it's not being pulled, it's not active through much of your range of motion. And so it forms a more protective role. And that the anterior longitudinal and interspinous ligaments, these ones here, actually have another unique feature we found in that they have bidirectional pre-strain, meaning that they are actually tugging in two directions at the same time. And that's allowed because of the interface here to the supraspinous and to the ligamentum flavum, and for the ALL from its uh, attachments to the bone uh, and to the disc, uh, which means that it's not a one-directional unit like it's often uh, uh, looked at and modeled. We uh, use nonlinear finite element models in our lab quite a bit. We have a pretty advanced model that we've used, especially for some of the work that we've collaborated with uh, Adino here. Uh, one of the pieces that I found, I mentioned as I went to academia to start studying the spine, was that there was not, um, even though there's a lot of mechanical testing work that's been done on the spine, most of it's been done at room temperature without any kind of compressive follower load on it. And it's been done at single speeds, which are pretty slow, about one degree per second or even stepwise loading. And we wanted to see what would happen as you did it at body temperature under 100% humidity. And so we did quite a bit of work. And then we looked at what happens as you actually look at different degrees of degeneration of the discs. Uh, and then we related that and we're able to come up with a model that actually predicts the mechanical properties of that at all ranges, all speeds of motion, basically within the voluntary range, uh, with, highly degree, with a pretty high degree of accuracy. With, this is just a Bland-Altman plot showing the predictive capability of our model. Um, uh, what that did is it provided a tool for us then to be able to use this to actually look at some clinical problems. And this is where some collaboration with uh, Dino started. We 
met each other at a conference in Philadelphia and started talking about uh, some of the strengths that he has here at Hong Kong University at uh, the hospital here and then some of the strengths we have in our lab and we started using our finite element model then to look at incidence of Schmorl's nodes, which uh, you know is related to the patient population, the uh, pretty tremendous uh, uh, clinical uh, group you've got here, the cohort of the spine cohort here, and also uh, to start looking at the uh, pain and and what's happening with the pain, and to try to predict mechanically uh, something that might relate to that and. Uh, Thankfully, it, it actually worked out pretty well. We modeled the same uh, cases that uh, uh, had been published by your group here with regards to uh, individual versus contiguous versus uh, skip level disc degeneration. And we looked at the stresses and the strains that happen in the discs and in the bones as a result of those different configurations in all different types of loading. and. Uh, Basically, uh, to orient you a little bit here, green would indicate that you've got an area where the bone strain energy is about the same as it is when you don't have any disc degeneration. The blue would be a place where you've got a lot less bone strain energy, and the red would be a place where you've got a lot higher bone strain energy. And one of the interesting things that we found is that the magnitude of the changes that we saw were correlated with the locations and the uh, incidence rates of Schmorl's nodes. So we could actually pretty easily predict that we would see Schmorl's nodes in the same locations that uh, you actually found them clinically in your cohort. We were also able then to look at the stresses and to identify when we had stresses that correlated with low back, higher low back pain scores, uh, the skip level versus the contiguous level uh, data that, uh, that your group has presented. Um, and uh, I'll hurry through that a little bit because I wanted to get to some of this more de medical device innovation, but I guess uh, one of the end products is that I'm a big fan of the spine. <laughs> I like the way it's designed. I think it's got some great things. Of course, some things, sometimes things go wrong with it, and lower back pain, as you probably all know, is the most significant uh, de uh, degenerative condition, bar none, on the planet. It results in, uh, you know, the leading cause of disability, disability-adjusted life years, years lost to disability, and that's true as, as a planet, but it's also true in both the U.S. and in China, uh, second only to the common cold for doctor visits. Uh, and so we took that, and, and uh, when I first started at BYU, one of the first things I did was uh, uh, partner up with uh, another collaborator who had some some different strengths in mind, but a, a desire to work in this area. His name is Larry Howell, and he's kind of a guru on something called compliant mechanism design. Uh, and so we started looking and saying uh, existing lumbar TDR technologies uh, work in a way that's different than the body. They don't actually work in terms of uh, of compliance like the disc, which is a, a big chunk of cartilage that has a certain stiffness to it. They're actually designed, most of them, to function more like knees and hips, which are friction-free joints, right? The spine, that's not a very good char characterization of the spine. And so we thought maybe we could do the biomechanics better. And that led to a lot of the background research we did on spine biomechanics. Uh, Larry is um, probably, he's a very humble guy, but he's probably the world's expert on compliant mechanism design, uh, probably number one. Uh, and he's received n numerous accolades to that, but uh, he's worked for NASA, um, he's worked on uh, medical device robotics, uh, all kinds of ways. Right now he has some uh, pretty significant EFRI funding from the National Science Foundation to look at the unfolding of origami-based uh, satellite uh, solar arrays to collect energy so they can be packed very tightly and then unfolded. Well, he and I got together and started thinking about compliant mechanism design in relation to the spine and how biology often works through compliant mechanisms, meaning things that bend and move but don't have a joint to them. Uh, a great example is the heart, which of course has a tremendous amount of motion, but no joints. And so we came up with this design, which is a little bit crazy and looks like maybe a, a, a twisted Jacob's ladder. But the way that it works, and the way here, I'll just show you a little video of this.
is that this uh, essentially solid block of titanium is tied together with some, some tethers, these inside tethers. And the dimensions of those tethers, as well as the uh, material properties of the titanium, determine the torque rotation behavior in all degrees of freedom, meaning that we're able to exactly match how the healthy disc moves uh, in all directions. And then the curvature of this center block actually determines the motion that tracks the center of rotation of the disc. And so we can match as well that which happens in, in the body. This is the lumbar version. This is the cervical version. And we're pretty excited that uh, the cervical version is going into uh, clinical trials this fall in uh, the U.S., Fr in uh, the U.K., the Fran uh, France, and Germany. And the FDA has agreed to uh, use that data as well for its uh, IDE application. Um, but we're, we're excited. That, uh, that, that technology has been licensed by a small business that's gone forward. Um, interestingly, for those of you who have been involved in uh, any kind of technology development, we actually haven't worked on that device in about five years now because the device has been taken over by the com company and they need to solidify the design and then move forward to their testing and preclinical testing and all that kind of thing. So in the meantime, we thought about different ways that we could approach this problem of restoring the spine. And these were kind of the, the uh, design, the functional design requirements that we came up with. We wanted an implant which restored disc height and shared compressive load, kept the disc intact, restored the natural quality of motion, uh, allowed the nutrient flow to the disc to, be com to continue, to be biocompatible, uh, in implant and forget it, to have an infinite fatigue life. Um, uh, as a mechanical engineer, I'm, I love what we're doing with uh, stem cell therapies and gene therapy and tissue engineered discs, and I think they're wonderful. But I look at the fundamental problem that's going on in the disc, and one of it has to do with mechanics meaning that if I put a cell in the same micro-mechanical conditions as the existing disc, it's going to go through exactly the same transformations that the existing, disc, uh, the existing cells in the disc did. So it's going to degenerate just as well. So I, I'm a big advocate of these technologies, but I don't think they're going to work unless we also restore the mechanics of the situation. And so we move forward with trying to do something that would be compatible and friendly to those discs. And uh, this is the end result of one of those technologies. Uh, it's called the Flex Spar, and it's been through about three iterations. But right now, it's a, a very nice uh, implant that can be pre-compressed, uh, pre-torqued, so that it restores the spinal space. And then it shares about 50% of the load with the disc segment. And right now, we're moving forward with uh, probably our next step will be an, an animal test, which sounds really interesting. But that is where the alpacas come in. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's a kind of a closer picture of uh, the older version, and now we have a new version that's actually inverted to give us uh, tension in the these spring portions as we go into extension rather than compression. It gives us a little more space to work with. <coughs> a technology that one of my graduate students is working on right now is actually came about through an interesting um, an interesting insight. We were actually testing ex vivo. Uh, spinal segments and realized that uh, as we were putting our spine segments in uh, our testing machine and doing like everybody does, and you should be aware of this, most all of the biomechanical testing of spinal segments is done by individually segmenting out uh, cadaver segments and then putting them in blocks of, we're using a, a Bondo, which is an auto body fellow, it's an exothermic polymer, or it's put in some kind of low melt that's also at a high temperature for just to see what we were doing to the actual disc cells, we put a, a thermocouple in the middle of the disc while we were doing this. We measured the temperature in the center of the disc and it went up to about 114 to 116 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is much higher than the cells would be comfortable when, in fact, it'd probably kill all of them pretty quickly, which told us that probably almost all of the data we've got on the biomechanical properties of the spine is probably all garbage or at least some pseudo version of garbage, simply because we've already killed 
some of the tissue before we've done the testing. And so we wanted a mechanical way to hold on to these discs, uh, to the, to the uh, bones. And it turns out that there isn't a very good one out there. You put in screws in different sides, and, and you guys know if you've got any kind of osteoporotic bone and you put a screw in it, it goes through the cortex and there's nothing to hold on inside and it just wiggles around. And so we developed a device that could be externally clamped along the cortex, and it's a compliant mechanism which actually spreads out, clamps into place, and has several spikes that actually attach onto the cortex. So even if you've got an osteoporotic patient, it holds on very, very tight. And then we realized that this wasn't probably just limited to using ex vivo testing, but it actually has a nice, probably in vivo, application. If we can attach this onto the anterior portions of vertebrae, we can use it for a connection between different uh, vertebrae to do fusions or dynamic stabilization or different types of attachments. Of course, we would never use this version with this sitting right here behind the major blood vessels in vivo, but uh, we can move this attachment to different locations on this as well. So that's uh, a current project we're working on. And So these are some of the devices in the spine that have come out of our lab. Uh, just very quickly, I wanted to show you a, a couple more examples. Uh, this is a different example that has to do with uh, uh, carbon infiltrated carbon nanotubes. It's a collaboration with this guy right here, which is uh, Brian Jensen. And the understanding part here was that uh, cardiovascular disease and that there's significant uh, concerns we've got, even with our most current stents, in terms of the way that it includes arteries. We've reduced restenosis rates, but we haven't. Uh, increased our uh, mortality rates over the long term for these patients. Um, and nanoscale, there's significant problems. Uh, nanoscale features may be the keys to the problems of stenosis, restenosis, and interactions with human and bacterial cells. Well, Brian works on what are called MEMS devices, so these micro-electro-machined. Uh, so this right here, for example, is a device that's holding can hold a cell right in the center and it actually takes and injects DNA into the cell to be able to do DNA transfection. And he and I were talking about one of the materials he was using, which is this carbon infiltrated carbon nanotubes. And he said, oh yeah, it's just carbon nanotubes that we pattern and we grow up and then we put uh, carbon around it at really high temperatures. And I said, hey, that sounds an awful lot like pyrolytic carbon that we've been using in heart valves for a very long time. I bet you it's biocompatible, we should find out. And that started a, a collaboration that's been going on now for about five years. Um, so this is how this process works, essentially how it worked originally. Silicon wafer, we put photoresist on it, just like you're making a computer chip. And then we lay down a layer of alumina. And then we lay down a very thin layer, four to seven nanometers of iron. And wherever that iron is, it seeds carbon nanotubes that grow straight up. And they can grow anywhere from a few uh, microns up to about a millimeter high, and we can pattern them. Here's actually a, a SEM, and you can see the tight patterns we're able to do. And essentially, it's tied to computer chip photolithography. So we're cheap. We're about three generations behind the latest, uh, you know, Intel price processes, but still, it's it's fantastic resolution. <coughs> And this is a side view, and you can see these, these vertical strands here, they're carbon nanotubes, and then we've taken carbon-rich gas and attached it. Anyway, the point is it's a material structure, and uh, it's essentially a ceramic, but you can see the mechanical properties of that ceramic. And so it's got a tremendous flexibility to it, and it turns out to be extremely hemocompatible. Uh, this is our hemocompatibility results over here on the side, and you can see the more um, just raw look at them. This is micro-polished stainless steel along the top or in the blue lines. That's typically what's used to make stents out of. Uh, and it's got a very, very low surface roughness. Our uh, CIC and T material is in the orange, and it's got about a thousand times higher surface roughness. And you can see it's got incredible uh, hemocompatibility. The lower this bar is, the less blood proteins are sticking to it. And interestingly, we tried, we thought, oh, if it works really well there, let's try uh, making it less rough. And that's what all these are down here. And it turns out it just makes it worse. We're actually best off having the rough surface because it's a very different interaction with the cells. And so we're making stents out of them. 
and you can see our process is to leverage the planar photolithography and then actually roll them up and we can actually lock these pieces together to make uh, stents. Uh, we're not to the uh, clinical trials or anything, we're pretty far behind that, but uh, we're hoping in the next couple of years to be moving to that point. W along the way, we noticed that uh, an interesting thing is we were looking at the SEM images of our material and that was that it looked somewhat like the surface of a dragonfly wing or a cicada wing or a material that is man-made called black silicon but very expensive to ma make which is ion etched out these little pillars that we had these nano pillars and we thought I wonder if like these we're structurally antimicrobial meaning that we kill bacteria not because there's a drug but simply because of the mechanical structure and uh, so we did quite a bit of uh, testing on that, and it turns out it's true. In fact, this is a, a test of MRSA uh, after a 48-hour biofilm growth. And you can see, basically, there is no MRSA on this structure. Uh, looking in tight uh, with the SEM, you're able to see uh, a small surface defect here was basically the only location where we had any MRSA growth. This is what's more typical to see, on a, for example, on a stainless steel control you would see this growth of the MRSA, MRSA, MRSA bacteria. And then uh, maybe one last example quickly. This has to do with nanocomposite sensors. In this case, I was drawn to this problem because biomechanical strain is particularly difficult to measure. It's very high, 40 to 60 percent. Most of our strain gauges uh, can only go out to about 3 to 5 percent before they break. Uh, so the body uses soft composite structures for measurement uh, and we wondered if we might be able to make an artificially created soft composite structure. So in this case my collaborator David Fullwood had been playing around with uh, nickel nanostrands and nickel coated carbon fibers embedded inside polymers. And so we embedded those inside uh, silicone and we came up with a strain sensor that can go out to about 100% strain uh, and linearly track uh, as it has changes in resistance that cor correlated exactly with its stretch. And so we take that silicone strain gauge, um, and silicone, by the way, is a nice material for implants. It actually works very well in the body. Uh, we connect it up to a micro Arduino right here, which is about the size of a dime, and it talks to your local smartphone. Foam, uh, and uh, we've used it then to look at uh, interpreting sign language, which is what this glove does, to track your motion within uh, 3D immersive space like virtual reality. We've attached it on one of my grad students worked on this project, which was taking that strain sensor, embedding it into a, a, a band and eventually into clothing that can actually sense when the baby is kicking or turn, turns over, and we can actually track contractions as well. Um, and costs about ten dollars. I mean we're talking about a very inexpensive, uh, can actually be incorporated into a woman's clothes pretty easily. We've used it to track joint angles in the body. For example, this is the knee flexion angle and we can track with accuracy, uh, very high accuracy, the, the movement of that knee angle. Um, we had an epiphany when instead of using just the, the uh, clothes, the, the raw silicone, we actually put it inside of a silicone foam the same nanoparticles, and found out that this foam was actually piezoelectric, not just piezoresistive, meaning it gives off a voltage that's proportional to the energy at which you stomp on the thing. Um, and found that that worked not just for silicone foams, but also for latex and polyurethane. Uh, and this material then we've embedded inside football helmets to detect uh, the energy associated with a uh, concussion. Uh, we've embedded it inside shoe soles so it can actually get your ground reaction force as you walk. Uh, that technology has been licensed, received quite a bit of press actually. Uh, and in terms of accuracy, this is a comparison with, for example, the TechScan F scan sensor, which you may or may not be uh, familiar with. It costs about $3,000 for that sensor. Ours costs about $3 and has about exactly the same performance. And uh, this is a comparison with your traditional force plate. Uh, and the force plate itself is about ten thousand uh, dollars and our again our sensor about three dollars has very very compatible um, performance uh, and so currently we're working with some funding from the National Science Foundation to uh, turn these two technologies the foam and the the strain sensor into a mobile gate lab that can do everything that your you know multi hundred thousand dollar uh, US dollar uh, gate lab can do but for less than a hundred dollars talking to your smartphone 
And we think that there's some tremendous medical applications of that, including uh, virtual physical therapy, actually tracking neurological um, disorders, and maybe even diagnosing them, and uh, as well as just uh, helping people improve their athletic performance. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, wrap up. Uh, obviously, this doesn't happen uh, by one person. Here's just a few of the students that have worked with me on this. And then, uh, of course, some of my main collaborators. And I just appreciate your time and welcome any questions you might have.